So would a ban on Russian oil imports really pad the pockets of Vladimir Putin? Here to talk about this and other developments in the Russia-Ukraine situation is U.S. Rep US Congressman Chuck Fleischman, who serves on three subcommittees in the House Appropriations Committee, including the Subcommittee on Homeland Security and the Subcommittee on Energy and Water Development. He represents the 3rd District of Tennessee. Congressman, welcome back to Washington Watch. Joseph, it's always a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Well, it's good to speak with you. What's your reaction to the White House's statements that there will not be a ban on imports from Russia? It's disappointing. And I think, understandably, um, uh, people in Congress, in the House and the Senate, will probably try to persuade the Biden administration to take another look at this. Um, let's face it, the world is properly outraged and should be outraged uh, by the horrific invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And we need to use every tool that we can, especially economically, to uh, disregard uh, the Russian oil situation is a big, big mistake for Joe Biden. Uh, oil is a commodity. Uh, and as a commodity, uh, the world reacts to it. Uh, wheat is a commodity, natural gas is a commodity. Um, we have got to be strong, loud, and clear. Let's face it, since the invasion, uh, Russia has stepped up their troops, stepped up the firing on civilian targets. We've got to be loud and strong and say no to Russian oil. Do you have a sense for how much of the United States oil supply comes from Russia? So if we were to, yes. uh, what is that number? Uh, right now, we've been told it's 4%. Um, but remember, as 4% uh, of, of imports, and sadly, there was a time uh, I voted uh, in my tenure as a member of Congress to actually allow the United States to export oil. That was tremendous. A great vote, a proud vote. We were one of the world's largest exporters of oil under Donald Trump in a very short period of time. Now, because of the Biden administration's policies, we are dependent on foreign oil. We are an oil importer. That's outrageous. We need to ramp up domestic energy production. I think that's very clear. But to answer your question, it's 4%. But if we lead and we say no to Russian oil, other countries will do the same and put pressure, economic pressure on Putin to hopefully leave Ukraine uh, because otherwise they're just going to continue on the path, sadly, that they're doing. It looks like they took over one city in southern Ukraine today. They're engulfing other cities. They're inflicting casualties. We need to be loud and clear about this. Now, I know that European countries depend much more heavily on Russian oil. Is it possible that the Biden administration is essentially just following the lead of Europe, who may not want to, to uh, have sanctions against Russian oil, and President Biden is simply following Europe rather than leading Europe? It's an interesting question. Obviously, Russia has abundant oil and natural gas, and you're right. European countries are, are doing that. But I look to the Germans as an example. Think about this. Uh, Germany canceled the Nord Stream pipeline. That was clearly against their economic interest, but they put morality and the need to sanction Putin for this outrageous conduct against Ukraine, against a sovereign nation. So I think it's so important to stand up and say no. Um, I don't know exactly what the Biden administration is thinking on domestic or foreign policy. Uh, we've seen huge debacles uh, in regard to both. Um, Biden needs to be stronger. Uh, I think the House and the Senate will be stronger in our resolve to deal with this. And ultimately, I think the Biden administration will wake up and be more draconian in its sanctions against Russia. Also, we need to look at the credit situation, the international banking situation. I'm glad to see a lot of private companies in the United States standing up against Russia. There is a universal resolve against Russia going into Ukraine. It's been loud and clear. It needs to be. It needs to be unequivocal. And as time goes on, it will get louder against what Putin has done. You mentioned Germany and the uh, 
unusual, maybe surprising steps they've taken. We've seen Finland, Sweden respond in ways that others didn't expect. Even Switzerland has come off the sidelines in this conflict and, and um, banned Russian bankers uh, and, and closed off access to accounts, Russian accounts in Switzerland. Are you surprised by the, the solidarity and the severity of the response from the European community? I'm impressed by the solidarity. And Joseph, you're absolutely right. You take a nation like Switzerland, which uh, historically has prided itself in its neutrality uh, time and time again, even through some of our more uh, horrific conflicts in the past century. For them to stand up and to do what they did not only takes courage, they're right to do that. Uh, I will say this, uh, the Russians have greatly uh, underestimated and miscalculated the strong international resolve against their aggression in Ukraine. It's being heard loud and clear. Uh, there will be a very strong punitive response diplomatically, economically, and otherwise. So uh, I won't say surprised, I'll say impressed. Uh, for Vladimir Putin, this has become a politically incorrect war, and he's losing it. Now, perhaps in, in an encouraging development, Ukraine and Russia, their delegations met together today. They agreed on the creation of a humanitarian corridor to get civilians out, humanitarian aid in. Is this a good sign that this might be able to be resolved? Anytime we can have dialogue, I think it's a good sign. Obviously, I think Russia and the Russian people have realized that their leadership have gotten them into not only an unpopular war, a grossly unpopular war with horrific consequences for civilians. When you see over a million refugees streaming out of the country, it's, it's horrific. And all of the neighboring countries are outraged, as they should be. Our NATO members, uh, all 30 are outraged. So uh, that, that is a step in the right direction. Dialogue is very important, but I do think uh, the Ukrainians need to be loud and clear that Russia has got to leave their country uh, immediately and then seek to rebuild some of the damage that they've done to the infrastructure, to longstanding buildings. Even a Holocaust memorial was impacted by a missile strike. It's outrageous and it's wrong. And in that case, uh, very ironic, the fact that a Holocaust memorial would be struck uh, by a missile strike in this invasion. Now, when we hear about the creation of this humanitarian corridor, some of us are confused, and I'll include myself in this. Why would Russia agree to this? Because it seems pretty clear that humanitarian concerns are not at the top of their list right now. Are they still trying to maintain some kind of moral high ground here? It's another excellent question, Joseph. I think in reality, Russia has realized that they have put themselves and their nation in an untenable, unwinnable position. Even if they have gains militarily, they have lost the public relations war, they've lost the public opinion war, and they are receiving, justly so, international condemnation, not only from the United States, but from European countries, the European Union, NATO members, other countries, they realize that they're stuck in an untenable, unwinnable position. So uh, I think they're going to try to figure out how can they extricate themselves from this situation uh, and resume or at least maintain some semblance of international respect. Uh, but dialogue is, is one way to get that with the Ukrainians. Uh, maybe the issue of Ukrainian membership in NATO or not is some way that we can discuss this issue with them. But clearly, clearly, the magnitude of the damage caused, the death, the carnage, the destruction to uh, uh, infrastructure and other buildings, uh, as well as people in Ukraine, uh, has put Russia in a position that it can no longer maintain really much of an international uh, semblance of decency. They're wrong on this. They know they're wrong on this. The world knows they're wrong on this, and uh, they've got to try a way to negotiate their way out of it. 
President Zelensky has uh, spoken about what he thinks needs to happen to end this. Here's what he had to say. Let's go ahead and play clip three, and then I want to hear your assessment. You said you want to talk to Putin. You just no, no, I, I'm not. It's not about I want to talk with Putin. I think I have to talk with Putin. The world has to talk with Putin because there are no other ways to stop this war. That's why I have to. Congressman Fleischman, yeah, what, what's your reaction to that? I think he's absolutely right. Uh, I applaud Zelensky. I give him very high marks. I have not met with him. I met with Poroshenko, his predecessor, when I went to Kiev and spoke with the Ukrainians, as well as going to Georgia, where there is Russian aggression. They've taken over 20 percent of that country and stayed. But he's absolutely right. Uh, he needs to speak with Putin. They need to sit down, leader to leader, and basically find a way for Russia to leave as quickly uh, as possible and then to allow Ukraine to rebuild from this horrific attack and invasion on their country. But yes, it needs to happen as quickly as possible. And Congressman I think the best to do it is one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, we are out of time, but we really appreciate your time being with us. We'll talk to you soon.